Good evening, and thank you for joining tonight's teletown hall with Co telephone town hall meeting with Congressman Andy Barr. Congressman Barr will be joined by Dr. Mark Doherty, an infectious disease specialist who has served as hospital epidemiologist at Central Baptist Hospital since 1988, to give you an update on the coronavirus pandemic and answer any questions you all may have. In just a moment, Congressman Barr and Dr. Doherty will begin with a few remarks to give everyone time to join the call. This technology allows people from around the 6th District to join us live to ask questions from your congressman. If you have a question for Congressman Barr, please press star and then 3 on your phone. Again, that is star and then 3 to join the queue to ask a question. With that, I'll turn it over to Congressman Barr for to update us on the federal response to the coronavirus and then to Dr. Doherty to provide his medical expertise. Uh, good evening, and thank you all for joining us tonight for this important update on the uh, federal uh, response efforts to the 2019 novel uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 pandemic. I want to first and foremost thank uh, Dr. Mark Doherty, epidemiologist at uh, Baptist Hospital, uh, for helping us out tonight and joining the call. As uh, all of my constituents know, um, uh, our uh, doctors and nurses and frontline healthcare workers are extremely busy right now uh, throughout uh, central and eastern Kentucky, and we're very grateful that Dr. Doherty could take a little bit of time out of his extremely busy schedule right now to give us uh, his expertise. And um, uh, Dr. Doherty is um, a, a nationally well respected uh, epidemiologist and, and will uh, be able to offer his medical expertise uh, to any of you who have questions about. Uh, the the illness that uh, that is the COVID-19 um, virus. Before I give an update on the federal response, I want to first thank all of the talented doctors, nurses, and healthcare professionals, as well as our first responders and public servants who are courageously caring for patients during this difficult time. As, as Dr. Doherty can attest, um, you know many of our nurses and doctors who are treating um, sick patients right now. They're putting themselves and their own health and the, the health of their own families uh, at risk. They're taking all the precautions that they that they can, but uh, it's a real selfless um, calling that they're they're undertaking here. And so we really are grateful for their work right now. Uh, as we have seen in the past few weeks, we are taking a whole of government, a whole of society approach to protect the American people. Uh, we're engaging both the public and the private sectors to combat the COVID-19 virus. Uh, let me first uh, update you all on the progress that we're making on diagnostic testing, which has been frustratingly slow, at least uh, for the past few weeks, but it's getting better. Uh, currently, over 254,000 Americans have tested positive, uh, I'm sorry, who have, who have been tested total uh, for uh, COVID-19, with a little over 35,000 at this point testing positive. Uh, for COVID-19, um, and that's according to uh, the Vice President and Admiral Brett uh, Girard, who is the Assistant Secretary of Health in charge of the Public uh, Health um, uh, Corps, um, and he's leading the White House Coronavirus Task Force testing co uh, coordination. We have, at this point, 124 confirmed cases here in Kentucky, uh, and I just want to point out that the confirmed cases, the positives, the 35,000 nationwide, that does not include tests that, are, um, that, that have been taken but have not yet come back yet. And it also doesn't include many of the, the tests that have been performed by some of the local and hospital laboratories. So it's not a total and comprehensive number at this point. Um, one thing to keep in mind, and I guess this is the good news, is that uh, if you have symptoms um, sufficient to justify a test, at this point, uh, in the the uh, the epidemic, um, your chances of, of of getting a positive result is only one in ten, and we expect that ratio to go down, that number to go down, the more tests that come back. In the most uh, um, hard hit parts of the country, uh, places like New York City, Washington State, California, testing does remain limited, and it's being prioritized to healthcare workers, hospital patients, and the severely ill. Uh, but since high-volume commercial laboratories, including LabCorp, Quest Diagnostics, and hundreds of small private laboratories have spun up to supplement the public health laboratories, availability of testing has improved significantly. And 
uh, as uh, the director of the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci has said, uh, the more that the private sector is, uh, comes online and the more we get uh, approvals, these emergency use authorizations from the FDA on faster, uh, faster throughput tests, uh, the better the testing situation will be. So while we still have a lot of work to do, uh, the public-private partnership on diagnostic testing has made progress over the last few weeks. As a reminder, if you have a question for Congressman Barr, please press star and then three on your phone. Again, that's star and then three to join the line to ask a question. Uh, next, before we turn it over to Dr. Doherty, I wanted to address the issue of personal protective equipment. Uh, we've been hearing concerns from many of our hospitals and our doctors and providers uh, in the 6th District about the need to bolster supply for critical personal protective equipment, the masks, the gowns, the gloves, to protect our healthcare workers on the front lines fighting this virus. It's so important that we protect them. We don't want to expose them. We need to keep them on the battlefield, so to speak, uh, and, and they just, uh, they, they're just they just doing very, very important work, and we need to protect them. So last week when we got word that we were um, burning through a lot of the PPE, we coordinated a resupply from the strategic national stockpile with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, this stockpile is the nation's largest supply of potentially life-saving pharmaceuticals and medical equipment. It was uh, delivered in two uh, shipments, two uh, truckloads to Kentucky uh, last week, uh, and it included invaluable medical equipment, 99,443 surgical masks, 55,989 face shields, 45,649 surgical gowns, 234 coveralls, 162,000 gloves, and 41,744 N95 respirator masks. Uh, we needed that desperately, and we're running through that very quickly uh, as we continue to protect the frontline healthcare workers. This weekend, working with um, uh, many of my colleagues in Congress around the country, we continued our efforts to successfully assist Kentucky hospitals and doctors to identify opportunities to procure additional PPE. Uh, I, I advocated also with the White House and the FDA and colleagues in Congress to modify a bureaucratic rule which would allow Kentucky bourbon distilleries to donate their alcohol to manufacture and amplify the supply of hand sanitizer, which, as you all know, has run out uh, across the country. Uh, in addition, we have successfully adv advocated for the inclusion of $1.7 billion in the upcoming fiscal stimulus bill to procure additional PPE for the strategic national stockpile to resupply the stockpile as they, as they push that out to the nation's hospitals and public health departments. And as we fight this pandemic, PPE supply will be, continue to become more and more important, and, and we will continue to be an advocate for our hospitals and medical providers to get them the equipment that they need to defeat uh, COVID-19. And as a reminder, for, for those of you just joining the call, you can get into the queue to ask a question by pressing star three on the phone, and you'll be put through an, to an operator, and you'll be placed in line to ask a question. And, and uh, again, before I turn it over to Dr. Doherty, I want to provide a brief update on the economy. Uh, top officials at the Federal Reserve have, have encouraged me to explain to my constituents that what we're experiencing is, is not a, a recession. Recessions are business cycle phenomenon. What this is uh, is a temporary partial and um, intentional shutdown of the U.S. economy for the purpose of confronting a short-term public health emergency. Uh, but as is evidence to all, the financial markets are being severely tested. Uh, the plumbing of our financial system is operating reasonably well, and, and bank resiliency is improved. But the stress is developing in markets, and, and regulators and market participants report that we can expect uh, markets to remain extremely volatile through the duration of this crisis, given the scale of the economic shutdown. And I recognize that this uh, economic shutdown is creating significant hardship for Kentucky businesses, farmers, and workers. And that's why uh, we're working to get your feedback and ideas. Congress uh, is putting the final touches on a bold and historic uh, stimulus package to provide cash flow to American businesses, workers, and families so that they can pay their bills and weather uh, this economic turbulence. So with that, uh, I will now turn it over to Dr. Mark Doherty for his remarks. Uh, Dr. Doherty has a distinguished career as an epidemiologist and infectious disease specialist. He currently serves as the hospital epidemiologist at Central Baptist Hospital 
And I want to thank Dr. Doherty for his time and expertise and know he is working overtime to treat patients and fight this pandemic. So, Dr. Doherty, when you're ready, go ahead. Uh, this is Mark Doherty. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, this is uh, really an unprecedented event in uh, our country's history. Uh, we, I've been doing this for over 30 years. We've studied, you know, epidemics and pandemics that have happened in the past, and we just haven't seen anything like this before. <clears throat> uh, we've tried to, you know, prepare in the past, and uh, back in the time of uh, SARS, we did a number of things here at Baptist Hospital to try to prepare for it as we, as we built our new hospital structure. <clears throat> we uh, had multiple negative pressure rooms put in, whole floors that could be converted to negative pressure, uh, which is important in terms of preventing, uh, in some situations, spread of the virus. Uh, we have whole floors that we can turn to negative pressure, one in sequence, one after another. Uh, we uh, actually put some uh, some ventilators in, in storage in warehouses in case we needed them at some point in the future, some ventilators that we were going to otherwise uh, turn in and uh, um, uh, as we bought new ventilators. Uh, so we've thought about things like this before, but I don't think anyone really had uh, enough imagination to think that anything this bad could really happen. Now, I think the, uh, the main advantage that we have here is that we're trying to listen to our colleagues in China and in uh, Italy and in other countries where this happened first. So we're trying to learn some lessons from them and listen to what they're telling us. Um, what typically happened in these areas is that uh, first the trickle of patients came in and then, uh, and then more patients and then finally it increased exponentially where the healthcare system really could not take care of the patients properly uh, and uh, the uh, healthcare providers ran out of personal protective equipment and, uh, ex and then they got exposed and then in turn got infected and then, and then infected the other patients. So it's estimated that over 40% of the cases in Wuhan, China, for instance, were caused by transmission from healthcare workers. So we have to make sure that the healthcare workers don't get infected, not just for, the, for them and their families, but also uh, to make sure that they're not infecting patients. And in that regard, we have to, we have to really, uh, uh, we have to have more personal protective equipment. But one of the things I think we've really realized over the past a couple of weeks that we have to conserve our personal protective equipment. So we're trying to do innovative things that we never really thought of before, like doing uh, telemedicine in our own hospitals. So we've always thought of telemedicine as something where we're uh, calling someone at home and doing, uh, uh, you know, either a phone call or doing um, uh, uh, something, a, a video call. But uh, one of the things I've been trying to talk about uh, across the state with our colleagues and then uh, here at Baptist Lexington is uh, thinking about you just using your iPhone or an iPad to call in and talk on the patient. You can actually do part of the physical exam with the patient there. We have some Bluetooth stethoscopes that we can use uh, to listen to their heart, listen to their lungs, and uh, not ever go in the room. So we're really trying to reduce the number of healthcare workers that are going in and out of the room, uh, partially to conserve the personal protective equipment. And in fact, I think um, if we really make a concerted effort at that, we may be able to reduce our personal protective equipment down to a tenth of what we were using before, because we were used to having every single doctor, every single consultant, multiple nurses, uh, the respiratory therapist, the physical therapist, the house cleaning person, go in and out of the room multiple, multiple times. And I think that we can, uh, we're learning that we can really do a much, much better job at that in terms of conserving, and then we're trying to increase the supplies also. I do want to really thank, uh, you know, everyone, uh, all the businesses, all the people that are going through uh, extreme uh, economic hardships now, but I, I think if we, if we really prevent uh, the healthcare system from getting overwhelmed, I think we can uh, turn this into a situation where we have uh, hopefully less than 1% uh, mortality rate uh, instead of a 35 uh, to 4% mortality rate if the healthcare system gets overwhelmed. Basically, we need to drag this whole thing out over a longer period of time so the system just doesn't get uh, hit all, all at once. 
and we can't have things like uh, happen in Tacoma, Washington, and New York City where they got hit so hard, so fast, that they, they also just ran out of personal protective equipment this weekend and uh, we had to basically wear scarves in instead of, uh, instead of masks. So uh, we're working very, very diligently uh, across the state and, uh, and across the country trying to prevent this from happening. We, uh, for the first time ever uh, this weekend, we had a video conference with all of the infectious disease doctors in the state trying to address these issues, trying to address uh, things that are so rapidly changing from day to day. Uh, we, uh, uh, our group has 11 infectious disease doctors. We're one of the largest, uh, actually one of the largest in the country. And we have our doctors deployed in different areas. I'm, um, I'm working here at Baptist Lexington trying to coordinate things with the Baptist system and the uh, system in the state and things here at our hospital. We have Dr. Kennedy uh, working at uh, St. Joe's and, work, and coordinating things there. We have Dr. Rodriguez who's sort of who's serving as our uh, educational liaison and he's, he's actually putting up, uh, he's done webinars at uh, Baptist Hospital and also at St. Joe's that are up on their websites. It's on our website uh, and we're going to update that every week to 10 days as things change. He's doing an update actually this coming Friday. Uh, so you all are welcome uh, to look at that. We're encouraging uh, a lot of healthcare providers across the state to look at that. Uh, we're, we're trying to share that with everyone we can think of uh, because there are just so many issues and so many things that we're learning actually day to day as this goes on. Okay, uh, Mark, uh, thank you very, very much for that. and. Uh, We've got a lot of questions rolling in, so I'm going to try to take as many as we can, roll through them. I'm going to defer to you on the medical questions, and if there's a question about uh, uh, the, the federal response, I'll try to take those. We can both take them as we go along. And, and uh, uh, again, just if you want to ask a question, press star three on your phone to get into the queue. Now for our first caller. Okay. Okay. Our first caller, we have Karen from Winchester, and she has a question about PPE. Karen, go ahead. Karen? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Karen. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, I am a nurse of over 30 years, and I guess my response uh, and my concern is uh, about the ventilators. Um, I was hoping that we could get a quicker response on producing our own ventilators and our own personal protective equipment here in the United States. Um, there's been some question about how long that this virus lives on uh, surfaces. And so uh, I was wondering uh, if you have any insight into uh, the ventilator situation as the whole world appears to be in a bidding war for these items because uh, this is a global uh, pandemic. So I guess that my thought is, is that, you know, uh, if we could produce it here and we could go ahead and get started with that, would that not be the best course of action? Uh, yes, and first of all, Karen, let me thank you for your years of service as a nurse. And uh, this is obviously uh, very personal to you. Uh, we need to get PPE to our nurses, and we need to have a plentiful supply so that uh, that's the last thing they need to be worrying about. They need to be worrying about patients, and they need to be, have confidence that they uh, have the protection that they need to, pre to prevent infection of themselves uh, and uh, obviously protect their families as well. Uh, and the, the, the healthcare workforce is critical to addressing this problem, and as, as uh, Mark pointed out, that was really the problem with the um, – with what happened in Italy, one of the problems. So um, I got, just this afternoon, uh, I received a briefing from the Assistant Secretary for, for Preparedness and Response. In addition to getting that uh, resupply of PPE from the stockpile last week, uh, we uh, advocated for an additional replenishment of that to Kentucky today on the phone with uh, HHS. Uh, and. What, they can, what I can report to you is that the strategic national stockpile has a reserve. Uh, it is, uh, the department is managing that reserve with uh, what, what they call per rata allocations to the states based on population and based on need. They don't, 
They don't give you more than you need at any given time. Um, they're managing their reserve based on um, not only just um, uh, rationing the supply to the states, but then they're also engaged in an ongoing purchase of supplies from manufacturers. A and uh, the Commonwealth can make the, uh, an additional request at any time. I went ahead and made an additional request. So we've got the second request to the strategic stockpile coming in. Over the weekend, we've been um, connecting uh, the hospital systems with also other brokers of and private uh, entities that have relationships with manufacturers. It is true that some of those suppliers are from overseas, and as troubling as it is, uh, a lot of the manufacturers of this equipment are in China and Malaysia. Uh, those shipments that come in, we are being informed, are, are being inspected by customs to make sure that they're not counterfeit. And so that is happening, and federal officials are reporting that, uh, that there hasn't been a huge problem with that at this time. In terms of ventilators, I want Dr. Doherty to maybe uh, give us his thoughts on both PPE and ventilators. Uh, but uh, one thing that we are definitely doing under the Defense Production Act uh, and the administration is doing is, is ramping up more manufacturing of that. And in central Kentucky, we've been uh, getting some – Great request. A local manufacturer in um, in Nicholasville contacted me, and they uh, they have offered to start manufacturing ventilators, and we put them in touch with the vice president's office, and um, they are in the works for getting getting going on that. We're going to make sure that we can get uh, uh, some some local supply of ventilators here as soon as possible. Well, in addition to getting more ventilators, we're, uh, we, we're looking at ways of stretching out our current supply. And so by that, I mean uh, we're, uh, we talked to the anesthesiologists about using the anesthesia, anesthesia gas machines as a ventilator. Uh, even back in the time of SARS, when we thought about this, we looked at and modeled ways of putting more than one person on a ventilator. And uh, we've actually simulated putting up to four people on a ventilator had successful simulations with that. So, uh, you know, we certainly hope that things don't get that bad, but uh, that would be, uh, you know, a, a potential backup plan if we don't, if we don't have enough. Okay, thanks, Mark. And, and uh, Karen, hang in there. Thank you very much for the very important question. All right, our next question comes from Lori in Lexington. Lori, you are live now. Hello. Hey, Lori. Hi. So my question is, my husband's a dentist, and he was forced to close his practice last week, and he also laid off eight employees who live paycheck to paycheck. I'm a nurse practitioner, and I was also laid off. We now have no income. We have a home mortgage and a business mortgage. Our employees have bills and mortgages to pay as well. I'm concerned that all of us and many other practitioners across the state are all going to have to file bankruptcy if this shutdown goes on for weeks or even months. Can you give us a realistic time when healthcare offices such as my husband's dental practice that were forced to close can open back up? And if this goes on for weeks or months, what is the U.S. government planning as assistance to help pay the bills and payroll that continue to accrue? Well, uh, yeah, uh, I, go ahead, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I just, uh, I mean, I can't answer that whole thing, but I think uh, what we're hoping here is that uh, we we don't see as rapid an increase in Kentucky as other states have had. I mean, if you look at some of the data from Tennessee where they didn't do the social distancing as aggressively as Kentucky did, uh, their rates have climbed much faster than ours. Uh, we're hoping that this is really going to slow things down, and I think we'll have a better handle on that in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, we, um, uh, um, go, I, and I want to actually thank the governor for, you know, proceeding with kind of shutting things down more quickly and doing the social distancing because I, I do think that's going to make a, a huge difference in the end. We, I can't, you know, I, you know, I really, obviously we can't, we can't have everything shut down indefinitely or for months. Uh, and I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping that this is just going to be for, uh, you know, on the order of uh, two to four weeks. But, I, I, you know, we're just going to have to wait and see exactly how this plays out, especially over the next two to three weeks. So, Lori, uh, this is Andy. And um, we, we recognize that, 
you are in a, a very difficult financial situation personally, and there are many, many small businesses that I've talked to and, and families that I've talked to who are my constituents over the last week or so that are facing similar economic hardship, and it's not your fault. That's the thing that's, uh, this is just, um, it's a government-imposed um, uh, shutdown. Um, it's, it's not a traditional recession. It's the government requiring you all to shut down, and people are losing their jobs as a result uh, because of the, the public health requirements. So we recognize it's the, it's the government's responsibility to make you whole on all of this. So the, the bill that is pending in the Senate right now is um, it, it will help would, if it's passed, and um, I'm certainly supportive of what the Senate uh, is, is, is trying to do right now. Uh, here's, there's many ways in which it would help your family potentially. Um, there, there is a provision on, on direct uh, payments to families that, that that's, are under a certain income threshold. Um, but I think for your personal situation as, as I hear it, um, what would be most uh, important would be the small business provisions that would get your husband uh, a bridge loan that's forgivable to get his dental practice uh, uh, up and running uh, for the next uh, a couple, three months, uh, and that would be uh, potentially forgivable. The, the way that, that that would work is um, in addition to you know, direct uh, 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 recovery checks for families, uh, it, it would, it would for small businesses like a dental practice with less than 500 employees, including sole proprietors, independent contractors, and other self-employed individuals, the bill would provide 100% government guarantee of loans not to exceed $10 million made through December 31st, 2020. You would go through your bank, the bank that banks uh, the, the, the practice, um, and the allowable uses of the loan would include payroll support, employee salaries, paid sick and medical leave, insurance premiums, mortgage payments on the business, or any other debt of the business. And it would, of course, require the borrower to make a good faith certification that they were impacted by COVID-19, which, of course, that you all have been, um, and that you would use the funds to retain workers, maintain payroll. Now, here's the thing where it would really help you all. The legislation would establish that the borrower is eligible for loan forgiveness equal to the amount spent by the borrower during an eight-week period after origination of the date of the loan on payroll costs. And so rent and payments on utility, payroll, overhead, all of that would be forgiven um, if you hire back those workers. So the incentive is reopen the business, hire back those workers who live paycheck to paycheck, get them back on the payroll, you get the cash up front from your bank, the bank, the loan is forgiven because you've rehired your workers and you all continue to cash flow. Um, there were, there were some uh, changes that we had to make to some of the banking regulations to allow your bank to push out that, that money, but um, we've, uh, we've got those uh, regulations uh, fixed. So this is where it would really help uh, a family like yours, and that's why it's so important uh, that the Senate not hold this up and that the House not hold this up. People are sick. Families are frightened. The economy is ground to the ha a halt. Uh, workers are facing an unpredictable future, and that's why we've got to get this bill passed immediately. Uh, Lloyd, just let me just uh, offer this to you and to your husband. Call my office tomorrow and ask for Anthony, and we've got a whole group of small businesses just like yours that are facing very similar circumstances. We're going to work with you all uh, in conjunction with your bank to get an expedited loan once this bill passes uh, the Congress. Thank you so much. That truly means a lot. Well, Thank absolutely. You know and, <laughs> and, my, and my number, if you've got a yes. pen, the number is 859-219-1366. That's 859-219-1366 and ask for Anthony. And I'm sure there's other small business owners on the call. And if there are, Write that number down. Uh, we want you to call as well, 859-219-1366. This is a liquidity crisis. This is a cash flow crisis. And the goal is to keep it limited to the next quarter, but ultimately the public health situation will dictate how long. 
All right. Our I next just mentioned from oh, Brian. I, I was just going to mention one thing about the previous call. Uh, yeah. One of the issues that we were just dealing with today was uh, a couple of dentists who were sick uh, with respiratory illnesses and trying to get them tested try, as a as a healthcare provider uh, to make sure that they didn't uh, expose their patients recently. So uh, those are those are all issues in, in dental offices too that we you know we're having to address. And hats off to the dentists out there and also to the specialists in, in medical care who are sacrificing right now. They're, conser they're, they're shutting down their businesses in order to conserve personal protective equipment. So they are making enormous sacrifices right now. And for any of those medical practices, veterinarians, dentists that need help, call our office. Once we pass this bill, we'll be able to help with the, with the cash flow issues. Okay, and our I want to say we have we have gotten large donations from dental offices of personal protective equipment, so we we really really appreciate that. All right. Okay, our next question is from Brian in Lexington. Brian, you're on. Yes, uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity. Um, my question was uh, very much in line with the. The last question, I am a small business owner here in Lexington, uh, have seven people on my payroll, and we are uh, a service company that provides um, commercial refrigeration service, so we're, we're trying our best to, to keep the guys working and keep the commercial refrigeration equipment running, um, but it, it really was around what is forthcoming for small businesses to help with the cash flow. Um, you know, in particular, the the package that passed last week, um, granting um, employee sick pay and the FMLA guidance, it's just, you know, wondering yeah. how we're going to ca cash flow those requirements. Yeah, that was, you know, I voted for that because there's going to be people who need to take the sick leave in order to quarantine them for public health. Uh, and we, we, we delivered on free testing for everybody in that bill. But what we also did in, in recognition that it's, it's a double whammy for the small business owner, the employer, because not only is your business being interrupted by the shutdown of the economy, uh, you know, uh, that bill means that half of the America's workers can't go to work and, and aren't going to show up. So it's a huge hardship for small businesses. So what we did in that bill, the bill that is now law, is we fought uh, as, we, as we mandated the two-week paid sick leave uh, connected to the coronavirus we also uh, included in there a provision to reimburse the, the – to make sure that you as a small business owner would be reimbursed dollar for dollar for that through a, a payroll tax credit. And the original version of the bill didn't have that, which was a real problem. And the other thing is that for a business that has cash flow problems, you can't wait for that uh, tax credit. So there is a mechanism through the Treasury Department to get an advance if you don't have enough cash uh, in your estimated payments uh, uh, on deposit with the IRS, there is an advance feature uh, w that we can help you with. But I think in the long run, what's going to ultimately help you the most during the shutdown is to call our office and call Anthony, and we'll, uh, once we pass this bill, uh, you can get one of these forgivable loans uh, and hire back your people and keep everybody on the payroll uh, and work with your bank uh, in the process, and, and the government guarantees that. So uh, that's the way we're going to deal with that, and um, we're going to we're going to protect the taxpayer as well. Uh, and, and we can talk about that. But in the meantime, that's 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 what we would propose uh, uh, you to do in this difficult time. Thank you. All right, our next call is from Ronald in Madison County. Hello? Yes, Ronald, uh, go ahead. Yes, yes. this is kind of a medical question. Um, I noticed uh, people, some of the people that test positive for uh, the coronavirus, uh, they're not actually sick. Okay, if, is it, are you going to get sick if you test positive? That's really actually my question. Well, it's a very interesting uh, disease process in that you know, it looks like about 80% of people who get it are really not be, are, are either minimally symptomatic or sometimes even asymptomatic, uh, meaning that they're not ill from it. 
Uh, it's about 20% of people that seem to get ill from it and maybe around 6% of people that become critically ill. Uh, whether or not you get ill from it depends on a number of factors. Uh, uh, one of them is age. So what we're seeing uh, here is that it's oftentimes the 20 to 29 year olds that are uh, that are getting it, circulating around, socializing with each other, going to bars, going out, and uh, then they're they're infecting the older people, the people over 65, who have a much much higher mortality rate from it. Uh, in addition, people that have other coexistent medical conditions, maybe being treated for cancer or for uh, other or, or for other uh, diseases that suppress their immune system, those patients are going to have a much higher mortality rate. If if you have underlying lung disease, uh, emphysema, or heart disease, that's going to put you at increased risk. Um, so one of the problems here we have is that some people are going around with only mild symptoms and they're infecting other people. And uh, uh, that's, you know, part of why we have to do the social distancing. One thing that I think uh, kind of struck me when uh, I talked to the uh, virologists uh, this weekend at the U of L, they said that uh, they told me that uh, this uh, viral infection had produced higher viral loads in people than any other viral infection they've ever seen. So, and a lot of people, it's just a massive, massive amount of virus that's being produced, and uh, that's you know part of why it's uh, it's so tricky and uh, and and difficult um, you know to prevent getting infected. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. I think we we have we do have to remember that the 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 majority of people who get this are not going to get really ill from it. We have to try to sort out who's going to be right. ill and who's not going to be ill. You know, if you're if you're if you have a cold and and, uh, and just not feeling well and have some aches, you know, we we at this point we're advising people to stay home. There's not really any great any uh, any approved treatment for it, and the vast majority of the time pe people are going to get better. Uh, we don't want people coming into the hospital just because they're worried about. Uh, uh, having coronavirus really shouldn't go to a clinic either. The, t the testing availability at this point is very limited. And even if you had a positive test, the only thing, the only recommendation is social isolation, which you really should be doing anyway to prevent spread to other people. Uh, so at this point, uh, we, we want people to be medically evaluated if they're ill enough to where they, before the coronavirus outbreak, would have needed to be evaluated. If you have a fever of... <clears throat> you know, a high fever, and especially if you're starting to get short of breath. If you're starting to get short of breath, then that needs to be checked out. We need to, you know, check your oxygen level to see if you're uh, one of the uh, smaller percent of the population that's likely to get more ill from this process. Thanks, Mark. All right, our next question is from Stephen in Lawrenceburg. Hello? Yeah, Stephen, it's... Uh... Andy Barn and Dr. Mark Doherty. Yes, my question is the bill that President Trump and some of the Republicans are trying to pass, there's a certain two people in the Democratic Party that keep turning everything he does down. Why can't they just come together and put that bill and approve it? That way people like Lori and other people in previous callers that need that money can get the money for their small businesses, for their families, so they don't have to file bankruptcy. I mean – it's time we come together and do this for the good of America, not just for your own selfishness because it, because you don't like the man or because you don't like this. Why can't we all come together and make the bill happen? That way it's – the American people have the money they need, and the small businesses get the money they need so they don't go under. And my other question is – I know you really can't give a timeline on it, but do you – as we're – the rate we're going right now with the virus, do you see it going – into September, October, November? Okay, I'll tell you what, I'll take the first one and I'll let the doctor take the second one. Um, the first one is really more about Washington, D.C. The second one is more of a medical question. So uh, you're, you're absolutely right. We, we need to get this done. There, there, are, there are people out here in this country who are sick. Uh, there are family members who are sick. Uh, there, are, there are hospital workers that are stretched thin. We've got people, you know, families who are frightened. Um, as the caller uh, who just uh, was speaking, our economy is really creating a lot of hardship right now. It's not our economy. It's, it's the fact that we've shut down our economy intentionally uh, for social distancing, which we have to do. 
And so by no fault of their own, people are losing their jobs, and, and small business owners and employers are having to shut down their businesses, and, and workers are really struggling. So uh, we should not allow partisan politics to slow this thing down. Um, and what we're seeing, and, and I've, uh, this afternoon, we, I've worked really hard on this bill. We, it's in the Senate, but, but we've, they've been working with House members so that we, don't, so that we can expedite it and we don't have a long uh, debate in the House. And, and what we're seeing from this bill that came out from the speaker is a laundry list of, of things that have nothing to do with the coronavirus uh, economic shutdown. I mean, there's new tax credits for solar and wind, new emission standards for airlines, uh, carve-outs for big labor. There's required same-day voter registration, a bailout for the Postal Service. Um, there's a requirement that uh, there's a publication of of, of corporate pay statistics by race and race statistics for corporate boards. There's a minimum wage increase. There's a cash for clunkers kind of program in here. So, I mean, not, uh, climate change provisions. I mean, none of this has to do with the – I mean, they may all be – people have differences of opinion. I get that. And they may be good ideas, bad ideas, depending on your political perspective. But none of this stuff should hold up the emergency – relief that we need to get to families who have been laid off, workers that have been laid off, families that need checks, and small businesses that need emergency loans to hire back their workers and, and stay in business for this period of time. Um, so uh, we're, we're, we're going to, my, my hope is that we'll get this done by Wednesday or Thursday, but, but, but clearly we've, we've, we've got to come together on this. And by the way, I'm willing to work with any Democrat with an idea that actually pertains to the subject at hand. Uh, I did hear one uh, Democrat proposal, which I, I agree with and would be more than happy to, to work with them on more transparency on the way in which uh, the, the lending occurs. I, I'm all for that. Um, so uh, if it's a good idea that actually pertains to the subject matter, we need to compromise and move on. Fast track it and like, you know, just if they're not going to uh, pass it, just forget, you know, not say, are we, I don't think you can forget them, but just President Trump didn't have the orders to say, well, this bill needs to be done ASAP. Well, no, because be there's no, no, because there's some statutory changes and there's a lot of appropriations that only Congress can do. We have to have congressional intervention, congressional action, and, and I predict that uh, some of this petty politics is going to get set aside uh, another day of this, and the market is going to continue to to collapse, and and there'll just be too just too much pressure on the speaker. She's got to she's got to deliver. In in my opinion, that's okay. Uh, Mark, go that's ahead. With, Mark, go ahead with the second yeah, part. Uh, yeah. So there are a couple things here. You know, of course, we don't really know exactly how this is going to play out, but. Uh, I think one thing that we that we find highly unusual and really encouraging is the fact that the epidemic has just drastically uh, declined in China. Uh, uh, now China has uh, appears to have more cases from travelers coming out uh, uh, back to China uh, than they do in their own country, and they've been reporting very few new cases there. So I think that's highly encouraging in terms of uh, in terms of the you know, hopefully our epidemic slowing down, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a sort of similar fashion. Now, one advantage they have is that, of course, they're a totalitarian society and they were able to just lock everything down and everyone uh, stayed in their homes. And I think, uh, you know, that's sort of a, somewhat of a disadvantage that we have in Western societies with uh, people being independent and, and wanting their own freedom uh, instead of the, uh, the attitudes and history that the, uh, the Chinese have had. So, uh, I do find that very, very encouraging uh, that it that it slowed down, and it's not, it's almost unbelievable how fast it slowed down. Uh, we think that it may uh, stutter along here uh, for and play out over the course of a few months, but we're hoping that you know initially, uh, if we don't get a huge surge that overwhelms the hospitals and ho overwhelms the healthcare systems, that we'll have enough people that develop immunity to it uh, that uh, that. Uh, that it'll slow transmission, and that, of course, ultimately that, you know, in the next few months, I'm hoping that we'll have a vaccine and better therapies for it. 
As a reminder, please press star three if you'd like to get in line to ask a question. Our next question comes from Leanne in Richmond. Hi, Leanne. Hi. Um, what I was wondering, um, I'm one of those people that work week to week, and today they just informed us they would be cutting our hours in half. So I didn't know if the banks or any of the lending institutions were going to work with individuals to maybe defer their monthly payments or, you know, help out at all? Yes, a, a, couple, a couple of things, Leanne. For, first of all, in, in this bill, there are two things in this bill that I would, I would point out that, that if we can get uh, this out of the Senate into the House, I mean, I'm, I'm ready to drive to Washington tomorrow. I'm, on a, I'm, in, I'm in Kentucky now. I'm a, on a 24-hour recall. As soon as the Senate passes this bill, I'm getting in a, a car and I'm, I'm driving. I'm not going to fly. I'm going to drive to Washington and, and hopefully vote for this thing. We want to get this on the president's desk by Wednesday, Thursday, at the latest Friday, so that we can deliver the, the, res, the, the relief to you all. The, the recovery rebates in here for people like you uh, would put recovery checks of $1,200 uh, into the hands of every individual with adjusted gross income up to $75,000 or $112,500 in the case of a head of a household, married couples up to $150,000 uh, who file a joint return, $500 for every child, um, and then it, it phases out up to uh, $99,000 for, for individuals and $198,000 for joint filers. Uh, also, uh, we're, we're allowing the legislation, uh, if you've got a retirement fund, avoid this if you can, but we waive the 10% early withdrawal penalty for distributions up to $100,000 for retirement accounts and then allow you later to put it back in over three years um, without regard to the, that year's cap on contributions. So you don't get penalized if you, if you borrow from your retirement and then pay it back. And then also for your for, – and this is where it will really help you is, is if your employer and encourage your employer, whoever – uh, had to cut your hours back, tell them to call my office. And if they're an employer with less than 500 employees, uh, they can get a loan up to $10 million that's forgivable if they, if they pay you uh, your full amount and keep you on the payroll for the next uh, eight weeks uh, during the pendency of this issue. So we, we, we want you to get – we want to help your employer. We want to help your boss so that you get the full paycheck back, in addition to a recovery check if, you, if you're eligible for that. The, the final thing I would say is that we're talking to a lot of the banks that are banking people in the, in, in the Commonwealth, and we've changed some of the regulations in this bill to make it easier for the banks to restructure your loans, to put a payment at the end of your note, or to skip a credit card payment, uh, or a mortgage payment or whatever that is, um, and we're happy to work with your bank on that if, if, if we can, no guarantees, but uh, call our office because we've done some things to help the banks work with you. Okay, our next call is from Jody in Winchester. Okay, Jody and Winchester, you're on. Jody, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, go ahead. Um, I don't work. I'm a stay-at-home mom. My husband works in a car dealership, and last night, of course, that was shut down as of 8 o'clock today. I've done nothing but cry for the last few hours, not knowing how we're going to live, how I'm going to feed my three children. And obviously I can't go to work because there's nobody hiring right now, and I have three kids to homeschool. What are we supposed to do? Yep, I totally get it. And uh, let me just first say that um, I would encourage your husband to um, uh, uh, talk to, talk to the auto dealer. Uh, nobody's buying cars right now. 
And so that's why uh, the, auto, the, the, the auto dealers have to basically shut down. So what, what we're talking to a lot of the auto dealers in central Kentucky, encouraging them to take advantage of this forgivable loan program in order for them, for, for your husband's employer to get that loan that's basically a grant, they have, to, they have to put your husband back on the full payroll. Okay? So um, that's, that's number one. Number two are these, uh, are these um, recovery rebates as well that, that's part of this bill. Well, I understand that, but like he works. So, how does the dealerships deal with that? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I think you cut out. I missed uh, the question. Sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. I just was asking. Like my husband, he works for commission only. Right. You know, that's just the part of it. So, how would they base, you know, helping him out on right. that? Because it can vary. I mean, from month to month. Right, and and that's uh, that's a great question. And um, uh, what what I would like for you to do is uh, have your husband uh, call Anthony Allen in my office, okay? And okay. We will work with him on um, on that in in terms of uh, helping not only uh, educate him but uh, his employer about how uh, how he would be compensated in the interim. Okay. The, the loan that the, the the dealership is going to get a a pretty good deal with this uh, bank loan that again is forgivable for his employer. So we want to work with you. We want to work with the dealership and your husband, and we, and we can see what we can do to work that out for you all. The bill has got to pass. I want to just stress that we've got to pass the bill. It's got to become law. It's not law yet. But it, 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 if, if this becomes law, we can we can help all of you all with with the financial issues. Uh, that's that's what this is all designed to do, so that we can get past this shutdown, and then um, and then and get the economy going again once the virus uh, dissipates. Okay, our next question is from Joseph in Versailles. Hello, Joseph. Go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks for uh, thanks for everything you do, Mr. Barr. Um, so I just have a question. Uh, I'm a nurse anesthetist. I work in Lexington. I was furloughed. Some of uh, my coworkers were laid off um, <clears throat> due to the uh, cancellation of all elective surgeries. So uh, Lori uh, uh, asked the question earlier about how soon we would be back to uh, – going back to business as usual um, after the two weeks shutdown. I know that's, uh don't have a concrete answer for that. Well, this is um, Dr. Doherty. We, we might need your help in the interim with some of the patients in the hospital. So uh, maybe you can give us your number and we can give you a call if, someone, if, when, if uh, things get a lot worse here shortly. Yeah, uh, well, because I was furloughed, I'm working one week on and one week off, and the week I'm off, I have to be on call. <laughs> so uh, they kind of acted like we're not allowed to work anywhere. Um, but I'm the, you know, I'm a, <clears throat> I'm the main income. We're a family of four, got two small kids. So, um, yeah. you know, imagining this going past. A month to two months or three months is like uh, frightening. Yeah, um, yeah, I totally get that. <laughs> it's hard so, for me um, to imagine that it could go really go that long in terms of shutting everything down. We're just hopefully things will slow down here over the next two to three weeks, and we can get a better handle on it. Great. So, um, so Joseph, one other thing that uh, that that I want to say to to people like you and all healthcare workers who are sacrificing with um, uh, uh, with elective procedures, you know, um, the, the, the thing about that is the elective procedures have been stopped, uh, I think, by the state to, to conserve PPE. But the more we can get the PPE situation fixed and stabilize the ERs and the hospitals, 
the quicker we can get elective procedures back up and running. So the PPE issue solves, if we can solve that problem, we can solve a lot of problems. And gotcha. so um, we've got to prioritize. We just don't know yet what's coming to our uh, tertiary hospitals in terms of COVID. And so, and, and we don't have a, a real big backlog of supply. In fact, we've got a shortage of supply right now. So we've been working with the hospitals, with Baptist, with UK, with CHI and the others to, to get them resupplied through the national stockpile. And then we're putting them in touch with private brokers and vendors as well. And they're making contracts. And what's, what's helping with that is I can get them reimbursed through FEMA because the Stafford Act declaration freed up about $50 billion dollars and that FEMA money can be used to reimburse purchasing at the hospital. So we're, we're helping the hospitals resupply their PPE. And then if we get, um, if, if we, get uh, we, we had a, a call again today with um, Assistant Secretary Preparedness Response. They told us that two weeks ago they put out this RFP for a, five, uh, a, a 500 million uh, unit order. And from the manufacturers, 3M, Honeywell, and others, and that's starting to come online. And if if we really get a deluge of PPE uh, and and get the hospitals in a safe situation and the nurses in a safe situation with the PPE, I think that will bode well for for restarting the the elective procedure. Um, another, another thing that's going to really help is getting uh, more rapid testing available. So. Uh, right now, we've been wasting a lot of our personal protective equipment, waiting uh, sometimes a week for the test to come back. It comes back negative, and then we stop, but then we've used a whole week's worth of personal protective equipment on that patient. Uh, so that's starting to uh, ramp up. Uh, we've got uh, access actually uh, this week, and I want to thank UK for this, but they, they started their own testing. They allotted us 10 tests a day, uh, really, which we're using for the sickest patients. Uh, we have 10 tests a day available through another company in Alabama. And then we're, what we really need is uh, our own machinery here to be able to run the test. So we have machines here, a couple of different types of machines that can run PCR tests, which is what we use for the diagnosis. And they run PCRs for all kinds of other viruses. We just don't have this virus on the panel. So I just found out tonight that they, the FDA has approved uh, uh, BioFire, which is a, a company that we use and have several of those machines here uh, to do the testing. We're waiting for them to get us the reagents and the test strips. And at that point, we'll be able to do uh, at, uh, probably, uh, well, ultimately probably 10 an hour with that and another type of machine called a Cepheid machine. We, we already have that machine here and the company's been approved. We're waiting for the uh, reagents to come. So we think that's going to happen in the next, uh, hopefully in the next uh, 10 to 14 days where we can really get much, a much more rapid turnaround on the testing. Right now we feel like we're kind of blinded because we're so limited on the testing that we don't really have a good handle for how much of the virus is out there in the population. Uh, so we're going to have a much better handle on that in the next, uh, in the next couple of weeks. Okay, and our last question for tonight comes from Sharon in Sharpsburg. Hello? Yes, yeah, Sharon. Uh, yes, sir. Thanks for hearing my question. I have, I guess it's probably more than one question. Um, I understand that China is not a democratic country, but how is it, how is China able to fight the virus, provide PPE for its people, and still manufacture for the world? And what is our federal government doing to like regulate the process? Because right now it's Americans pit against Americans, state against state, and that seems so wrong to be bidding a bidding war like this when it can be regulated. Yes, yeah, Sharon. In manufacture. Yes, yeah, Sharon. Thank you very much. Very, very important question, and it is uh, troubling when uh, we have to go to a broker uh, outside of this national stockpile just to get resupplied, and the ultimate source of that is China. Um, you know, not a, uh, not a friendly country to the United States, and in fact, the source uh, of, of the uh, COVID uh, 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 virus. So 
very concerning, and um, there are a number of bills in Congress which I support that would do better in terms of uh, onshoring the supply chain for not only the personal protective equipment but ventilators and also the um, the components for some of the uh, therapies that uh, may be available. The one thing I will say in general, though, is I am so proud of the American private sector over the last several months that really stood up and stepped up to the plate. Uh, 3M and, um, uh, and, and Honeywell are a couple of corporations that are really standing up. Uh, General Motors is now going to start manufacturing ventilators. Uh, the small company uh, from uh, Nicholasville that contacted me, we're getting calls, uh, members of Congress all over the country from from companies that want to help out. The bourbon distillers want to help with their alcohol for uh, manufacturing uh, more hand sanitizer. And the amazing work of some of the uh, biotech and pharmaceutical companies that are already, they already have therapies and antivirals in clinical trials, and we have our first vaccine in a cl clinical trial. There's a lot of hard work that's going on uh, to um, create an independence from supply chains overseas uh, and that's why the president invoked the Defense Production Act as well, and, and that's really working. You're starting to see a lot of private sector companies uh, step up and, and, and join the fight against this uh, disease so that, so that we don't have to rely on other countries. Um, uh, Mark, do you want to say a final word? Uh, we, we've run out of time, unfortunately. Yeah, we've got yeah, a lot of so, other people who want to ask questions, but I want to yeah, give I you think, yeah. a final word. So in our uh, group-wide phone call uh, tonight, we kind of had the sense that things were not, uh, and this is just preliminary today, things were not ramping up uh, in terms of the uh, number of cases as fast as we had expected when we looked at what happened in Washington State, New York City, and even just south of us in Tennessee. So we've got our fingers crossed that uh, we didn't see as many new cases today, and we didn't see as exponential an increase as we thought we were going to uh, probably see and we were trying to prepare for. So we really thought that was kind of encouraging on our phone call today. You know, we'll just have to, we'll just have to see what uh, happens over the next few days. But, Andy, I, I really want to thank you for all the efforts you've made. You know, I, I, uh, for everyone listening, I've been talking to Andy and texting him multiple times a day. We were on the phone last night between 11.30 and midnight, and uh, we just, uh, I, I think uh, Andy has done really everything that he can to try to help us out in this, and we're uh, working uh, just as hard as we possibly can to try to uh, mitigate the effects of this outbreak. Well, thank you very much, and, and uh, more importantly, thank you and all the frontline doctors and nurses who are sacrificing so much and working so hard to keep our our people uh, safe and and um, and to treat those who are in fact sick. So thanks for all you're doing, Mark. And and please tell everybody over there in the hospital how much uh, we appreciate uh, all of their efforts right now in this difficult time in our country. And for all of you who called in tonight uh, with questions about the economy and the difficulties that you're facing financially because of the shutdown of the economy. I do encourage you to contact my office. We are going to work as hard as we can to get this bill to the president's desk this week so that we can start the important process of getting paychecks back to all of you all and reopening businesses, um, even if there's, there's not any business going, around, going on, so that your payroll will be covered uh, while the economy shuts down for this public health emergency. So call us, 859-219-1366. Ask for Anthony if you need help with any of that. Uh, and, again, um, we really appreciate uh, uh, you giving us the opportunity to serve you in, in, in Congress. Uh, I encourage all of you all to continue good health practices for yourselves and your families. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Um, you know, practice that social distancing. Um, we had a lot of questions we didn't get a chance to answer, and I'm sorry about that, but there will be an opportunity for you to leave a voicemail. If you just stay on the line, uh, leave a message and let me know what you thought about tonight's call. And, again, thank you for joining us uh, and for the privilege of representing you. Have a great night.